Harry's Wife, Part 96.2, The Rise of the Mid-Ranger. Hello, I'm H.G. Tudor, and welcome back to the analysis of an excerpt from the Palace Papers provided by Tina Brown, where she charts the rise of Harry's Wife from Hollywood Nobody, as described by Tina Brown, to Duchess to Be. And I'm utilising this to help you understand more about her background, but also to dissect this against the prism of narcissism to enable you to understand more about the behaviours, the mindset, why she's doing what she does. We pick up the tale following her securing the role on Suits. In between shooting the pilot in New York and the seismic news that the show had been greenlit for the next TV season, Trevor Engelson proposed to her on a romantic vacation in Belize. That would be significant positive fuel provided by an intimate partner primary source and demonstrating that he was very much under control. Suits required a five-year commitment to live in Toronto for nine months at a stretch of shooting. She signed on without hesitation. It would appear that there was no consideration of how that would impact upon her relationship with Trevor Engelson. And of course, a narcissist wouldn't be concerned. Yes, a mid-range narcissist might create the image of being concerned as part of facade management or the veneer. But ultimately, that sense of entitlement, that lack of accountability for behaviours, the absence of emotional empathy for how the decision would impact upon the nearest and dearest is all demonstrated by that thrusting desire to continue onwards and upwards. Now, of course, there's nothing wrong with somebody exhibiting ambition, but ordinarily you would think that the individual would consider, how would that impact upon my relationship being apart for such periods of time? Now, it is quite common within the acting industry for people to experience that, that they have to go away for long periods of time, and in some instances they take their family with them, in other instances they are apart, and it can place a strain upon the relationship. But if this information is accurate, Harry's wife gave no consideration at all to how it would impact upon her relationship. This demonstrates the single-mindedness of her selfishness, the sense of entitlement and the absence of emotional empathy for Engelson. The article continues... The first season debuted in June 2011 to strong reviews and pleasing attention. That will, of course, have provided fuel from tertiary resources to Harry's wife as a consequence of positive reviews. Shortly after it wrapped, Harry's wife married Trevor in a barefoot wedding in Jamaica. The wedding earned a brief write-up in The Hollywood Reporter. The bride wore a simple white notch dress with a sparkling silver waistband. A plane load of entertainment industry friends came down for four days of partying on the white beach. The only jarring note, one wedding guest remembers, is that in the itinerary Harry's wife sent out was a note requesting no social media, please. Assertion of control over the wedding guests. We were all laughing because she had been on suits for a few months at that point and we were like, is she kidding me? The guest told me she was already like, I'm a really big actress. Delusion, inflated ego, sense of entitlement, triangulation of individuals with her show. Afterward, the bride returned to Toronto and the groom to Los Angeles. The new Mr. and Mrs. Trevor Engelson settled into a married life that would be primarily be conducted on Skype. The fact that she had made this decision to marry him, notwithstanding the fact that she would be in Toronto, demonstrates that level of selfishness. Of course, Engelson went along with it. He could have protested, he could have decided that it would be better to wait before they got married, but it may well be, and we don't know the particular status of Mr. Engelson as normal or empath or narcissistic individual. It certainly seems that he's not a narcissist from the information that is provided, but it may well be similarly afflicted to Prince Harry that he had the addiction, or has the addiction, to narcissists, and therefore he would just do whatever Harry's wife wanted in order to keep her happy. At that juncture, of course, he would have been in the golden period, being given lashings, no doubt, a spicy poontang, complimented, and, of course, given the impression that his relationship was genuinely wonderful. One wonders if he had cause to pause for thought at that juncture to wonder 
Is it as good as I think it is if she is so intent on buggering off Toronto so soon? The article continues. Harry's wife was now earning around $50,000 an episode. Residual benefit. A working actress blog, that anonymous ballad of thwarted ambition, had to find a new author. Harry's wife's next online literary offering would be a stylishly designed lifestyle effort she called the TIG, after her favourite full-blooded red wine, Tianello. The TIG was an exfoliated, liberal-leaning world of undiscovered travel destinations, soft chats with influencers, ugh, synonymous with Harry's wife's upward trajectory, and women's empowerment causes, where even victims looked their best. Plugs for cosmetics, travel destinations, restaurants and self-care products made the TIG a dragnet for luxury freebies. She won a reputation amongst the marketers of luxury brands of being warmly interested in receiving bags of designer swag. Notice that the chameleon behaviour is being exhibited. The working actress, out the window, compartmentalise that, and straight in with the TIG. I'm onwards and upwards, and therefore my blog should reflect that. Now, to some extent, that is logical. But what about if she found that her ambition was thwarted? Why not, as a working actress, isn't that what she still was? By being in suits? Why not continue with that? And this shows the deluded grandiosity by which Harry's wife operates, that she's too good now for the working actress blog, and instead she wants to inhabit the world that she believes that the money that she's earning merits. And... If you haven't already, you may well enjoy my parody of the TIG called The Stig. All you need to do is search for it, and you will get a flavour for what it's about. Of course, she was utilising that as a means to assert control over individuals by portraying this particular lifestyle, triangulating the readers, to the extent that they existed, of this blog with the various travel destinations, products, etc., the women's empowerment causes was part of facade management, and, of course, the receipt of freebies, is a residual benefit. There's no shame when it comes to shilling for those freebies. The airbrushing of Harry's wife's life had officially begun, and of course, not it's not only narcissists that behave in that way, this is something that's undertaken by many people in order to portray a particular lifestyle, and of course, the narcissist behaviour of doing this in order to be that chameleon and portray a particular lifestyle through social media has infected use of non-narcissists by social media as well. One only has to consider the duck pout or the trout pout that has become so ubiquitous amongst social media postings. Airbrushing her life in this way is done in order to triangulate people with the lifestyle and to present an image that is not quite the reality of what it was, but that doesn't matter to her because she has no sense of accountability in that regard. The article continues. One who swiftly found he didn't fit the new picture was her husband, whose career was not on the upswing. For nearly two years, Trevor rearranged his life to spend sojourns working from Toronto, but Harry's wife rarely reciprocated. Selfishness, sense of entitlement, lack of accountability to the marriage, lack of emotional empathy for her husband. Trevor started to dread she was going to dump him. A friend tells me she remembers running into him at a wedding where he confided mournfully, she's not coming back anymore. We're not talking that much, really. This is getting ridiculous. She's in another country and we're barely seeing each other. I have this awful feeling that she's just going to become huge and leave me. Such behaviour demonstrates that, although he was the intimate partner primary source, at that juncture he was being used in the shelving dynamic, picked up and put down when she saw fit, with occasional Skype calls and meeting him every so often. That demonstrates her sense of entitlement, the fact that she had no emotional empathy for him, and that she had no accountability to the well-being of the marriage. She was focused on what mattered for her. He was not coming up on the radar that often because he was in Los Angeles. Even though he tried to accommodate the situation, demonstrating his own emotional empathy, that wasn't enough for her. One weekend, the article continues, when he came to see her in Toronto, Harry's wife told him she was out of love and it was over. Disengagement. Shortly after Harry's wife delivered the coup de grace, a package arrived for Trevor by registered mail in Los Angeles. It contained his wife's diamond engagement ring and her gold wedding band. She couldn't even bother to hand them over in person and mailed them to him. 
malign triangulation with the object, absence of emotional empathy. Had suits been shot in New York, as the producers and stars so ardently wanted, Harry's wife might have been swallowed up by a city unimpressed by minor cable stars in Los Angeles. The entertainment world is sprawling yet insular. Thousands of Harry's wives churn through unremarked. Toronto's charm is that both cosmopolitan and provincial. There's a permeable elite that's easy to navigate. Toronto resembles London in that the political, journalistic and theatrical worlds all sit at the same table, but it's profoundly different from London in its equitable absence of snark. When Soho House, the, three, the London-based membership club for status cultivators, opened an outpost in 2012 in a three-storey Georgian building known as the Bishop's Block, Toronto could officially claim a cool factor. For an aspiring cosmopolite like Harry's wife, who'd always felt othered by her mixed race, the city's ambience provided a heady cultural and social accelerant. She would harness the character traits of where she was for the purposes of triangulation. Within a couple of years, she was hobnobbing with TV host Ben Mulroney and his style queen wife Jessica, the heartthrob crooner Michael Bublé, and an assortment of celebrity chefs and film and fashion floaters. As soon as Trevor was ushered out of the picture, she started dating, first linked to a hockey hunk named Michael Del Zotto, moving swiftly on from former intimate partner primary source to seek a fresh one. And for the two years before she met Harry, the golden boy chef Corey Vitilerio, who was named as one of Canada's most beautiful people and whose restaurant, the Harvard Room, was a hangout for Les Tout Toronto. There it's exhibited that his good looks, his status, the fact that he would have connections, which would obviously be residual benefits, were all matters that drew Harry's wife. And of course, as a mid-ranger, she was focused on improving her social standing because unconsciously it would increase her ability to capitalise upon those prime aims. Now that she had her big break, Harry's wife was desperate to make Rachel Zane more than a support player in the Suits lineup. It was vexing that she was not listed higher on the call sheet. That would be a threat to control because of her inflated sense of status and importance. That all-important document in the world of film and TV production that's sent out to the cast and crew as the strategy map for the next day's shooting. The call sheet is more than a memo to actors stipulating what time and where each should follow up. It's also a status register, which makes the whole concept fraught. The dream of every rising player is to be listed on the call sheet at number one, with all the perks that go with it. Car and driver, your own trailer on location, the first consult on disruptive schedule changes, and generous expenses that include a sheaf of airline tickets for weekends. For the seven years she performed on Suits, Harry's wife was number six on the call sheet. That would have amounted to a threat to control, because she wasn't numero uno. She quickly sensed the clout of the veteran TV character actor Rick Hoffman and convinced him to secure from the producers a car and driver for her. Manipulation. Assertion of control. Residual benefit. A bold move, because a chauffeured car is a much-desired perk allocated to players listed at number one and two. Harry's wife was beloved by the show's producers because she never said no to promotion, and of course, she's not promoting the show, she's promoting herself. Any time we asked anything extra to be done, whether it was a fundraiser or glad-handing at the Television Critics Association event, Harry's wife always said, sure, I'll do it. In return, Harry's wife was able to make Suits executives powerful sounding boards. She sought advice on how to increase her part without looking like it's a land grab and expand her role. And of course, in taking such steps, this allowed her to get a further residual benefit. Her narcissism, of course, was functioning at a pretty decent level at this juncture. It was enabling her to get the chauffeured car. It was enabling her to stay in the show, being paid a reasonably decent salary. It was enabling her to hobnob with people and utilise them for residual benefits through network and character trait acquisition. And so the mid-range narcissism that she has was able to cause her to date and assert control over these friendships without too many difficulties. In effect, the society that she found herself in 
her mid-range narcissism was able to cope with it. In part three, we'll examine more of the rise of the mid-ranger, finding out more of what Harry's wife was doing as she continued her march towards the hapless Prince Harry. <laughs>